Today on Oklahoma Gardening, we work our way through some colorful plants. We start out by taking a closer look at a red hot tree. Then I'll share with you two of the most popular annuals you'll likely see at the garden centers. We have a spring native for the shade garden. And finally, I want to introduce you to a new person joining the Oklahoma Gardening team. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Oklahoma Gardening is also a proud partner with Shape Your Future, a program of the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust. Shape Your Future provides resources for Oklahomans to make the healthy choice the easy choice. I love sharing with you guys the cool things that plants can do. We're back here at the student farm. I want to share with you a tropical plant that you might find in some Oklahoma landscapes. It's important to know which plants we are dealing with so that we can continue to maintain them successfully for years to come. If you're looking to add a little color to your garden, why not go big by adding a prairie fire crab apple? You can see behind me the amazing display of cranberry covered flowers that cover the canopy in early spring. It's actually just a beautiful plant that's really gonna make that impact for people that might be going by your landscape. But the display doesn't just end in spring. In fact, it continues on as it pushes out that foliage later on. That's going to be kind of a burgundy red colored foliage in the summer months that will slowly transition to a deep green with some red veins in it as you go into the fall months. Now, finally, as you head from fall into winter, it's gonna produce these crab apples. After all of these pollinated uh, flowers that continue maturing, you're gonna get these small fruits that persist through the winter months and they're actually uh, edible and preferred by the wildlife. So you're gonna help uh, benefit that wildlife in your community as well. So it's really a small tree that's going to give you year round benefit. Now, again, I mentioned it is a small tree. It's only gonna reach and max out about 20 feet tall. So it's a nice tree. If you have utility lines or something going across the back of your yard, you can still plant this one underneath there. Now you might be thinking crab apples, aren't those prone to different diseases? Um, while some of them are, this uh, prairie fire is actually resistant to a lot of those that uh, kind of affect some of the more common crab apples. Um, so some of those diseases that you might hear about are fire blight, scab, cedar apple rust, and prairie fire has shown high resistance to those. So we've had these planted out here at the gardens for several years and have never had any problems with them. So an excellent tree to plant in your landscape. It does need full sun and well-drained soil. It is hardy to zone four, so you don't have to worry about sometimes those unseasonably really cold temperatures that we can get in our Oklahoma winters. This is an Oklahoma proven plant, so it is tried and true to add to your landscape. Petunias have come a long way from your grandmother's garden. It's no wonder that they're one of the most popular annuals to utilize in the landscape. And they used to just come in like solid purples, pinks, whites, and yellows. But since then, they have continue to create all sorts of different versions. In fact, so from here over, we're looking at petunias. You can see that we've now got doubles. We've got really dark ones. This one here is kind of bordered with this lime green yellow around the edges, and it's just really attractive. We've also got a lot that are now striped as well. So petunias, one of the nice things about petunias is Obviously, when they're out in the landscape, they give you that nice little fragrance, um, kind of a sweet smell as you're walking around them. Um, but 
typically uh, some of them are either mounding but then we also have these wave petunias that they came out with that really spread um, out a lot more so these are great in the landscape in a garden bed so that you can really fill an area with that annual color so this particular one is just a wave petunia that is a white one here um, and it's going to get about 30 inches in diameter and stay relatively short whereas some of these others will get more of a mounding habit to them now another popular line that's come out um, is the super tunias and those have been out for quite a while and they're coming out with more and more colors this particular one is called persimmon here and you can see how it has a nice kind of greenish yellow throat to it and then sort of an apricot rim around the corolla there um, the nice thing about the uh, super tunia series though is that they are self-cleaning meaning you don't have to deadhead them so some of the older petunias you might remember that you would have to go around and remove those spent flowers to prevent them from producing seed so a lot of times you would see the color it would come on and then it would sort of fade for a while and if you didn't deadhead it it would go into seed production and then you would find little seedlings later on in your garden so um, that's one thing that you don't have to worry about with uh, the super tunia series and some other uh, petunias that have been more recently developed now the other thing too is while a lot of petunias have bigger flowers on them they are also getting smaller so you might find some of these that are a little bit smaller here um, so this one is very similar to this older one, this royal velvet here. This is a Supertunia mini vista. And you can see the flowers are about half the size of this one here. So they are getting just a little bit smaller, um, almost starting to look like caliber coas. And we're going to get to those here in a minute. Again, here is another one. This is called a um, little tunia. So again, a very striped one. Kind of a bicolor there um, another bicolor here and then also this is another mini supertunia and so again you can see this is a regular supertunia here's a mini supertunia and then next to it here we have calibracoas and these are a different plant than petunias and so you can see um, although they look very similar um, and in fact are have a common name called million bells because of that bell shaped flower like a petunia and again they just put profuse number of flowers all over them but this is a fairly recent introduction um, they were kind of introduced into the horticulture market in the 1990s um, and have only grown in popularity since they have a much smaller flower than petunias um, about a half inch in diameter so you can see though the difference is while um, petunias originally had more of a solid color of course you know some of the hybrids have really changed since then the caliper goas really do have a mix and a range of color in each of their flowers and even on their plants in some cases so here we've got several um, and what's nice about them is they're just very dainty little flowers another benefit to having caliber coas is that they are all self-cleaning so you don't have to worry about deadheading them when they're out in your garden now as far as planting petunias or caliber coas so petunias um, do really well as a bedding plant. Um, they do like high organic material. So if you have heavy clay, you maybe want to make sure to amend that soil first with some organic matter or perhaps just stick them in containers. They do really well in containers too. So if you are wanting to fill a landscape bed and really cover that space, you might look at something that is like a spreading petunia um, versus more of the mounding petunias that are available on the market. Um, caliber coas, however, I would suggest maybe keeping those in a container um, just because they can be a little more sensitive to some of our soil conditions. They do really like a lot of good drainage and high organic matter again, um, but they can be a little more sensitive to that. So they work really well for containers. In fact, you'll often see that you can buy hanging baskets full of these caliber coas and they just make a beautiful display. The other thing to keep in mind with these is also the color. So if I'm looking for something to plant out in the landscape, you can see that these petunias come in both bright colors and also some really dark colors. And while this dark color might look nice on a bench, because a lot of times we're buying these, we're looking at them on a landscape bench, 
they might look nice. This dark color or even some of the darker ones might not look, look that good out in a large bed because they're just gonna look like shadows and voids in the landscape. And so it, it'll just kind of look like green and dark. You won't necessarily see that. Um, so if you do really wanna use some of these dark colors, go ahead and make sure to mix in some of these yellows or whites to kind of brighten it up and highlight some of those darker colors in the landscape, or perhaps use these in containers or beds that are really up close to your house where you're gonna notice them a little more intimately than somewhere farther away. Stick with the bolder, brighter colors um, for something that's a large mass planting out in the, in the landscape. Caliber coas, like I said, they work really well in containers um, because all of these need good drainage, but especially the caliber coas. But because they have such a mix of colors, these work really nicely in those container mixes. Um, and the other thing is you can kind of look at the different colors and pull out other combinations of flowers. So here, you can see we have a yellow, we have some peach, we have some orange. And so you could go ahead and mix several of these different caliber coas together and giving you a nice combination in a container. Um, and they also do even come in these doubles like you can see right here. So that is what you'll probably be seeing out in the nurseries right now, our petunias, calibricoas, and a lot of other annuals. So when you're headed out to the nursery, make sure you know what you're shopping for. Today we've got a beautiful native that is blooming here in our shade garden. Um, now we're in early spring, it's about mid-March here in Oklahoma, um, and you can see that the celandine poppy, also known as the yellow wood poppy, is already up and blooming. In fact, it blooms a little bit early, um, even well before a lot of our other perennials have even begun to emerge out of the ground. What's really fun about this is not only the bright color adding some interest into that darker shade, but also you can see here it has four petals. And this is a characteristic of the poppy family, um, not exclusive to the poppy family, however, but it is a characteristic. Now I say petals, but actually botanically speaking, these are technically the sepals of this flower here. So after they're done blooming, they're actually going to produce kind of a fuzzy pod um, that will turn into seeds. Now, you don't have to worry about this plant being an aggressive seeder. However, it will reseed. In fact, they say that ants are kind of responsible for distributing those seeds. And so you'll find that it's not just the, the new seedlings are growing right underneath the mother plant. In fact, you might find them kind of some distance from the original plant. You can see here we have a few that are just kind of scattered back and forth around this plant. Um, so you don't have to worry about it being aggressively reseeding. What's nice though is it does kind of create a repetition through your landscape of this plant as it evolves. Now the foliage will begin to emerge um, early on and it's kind of got this basal growth which means all the foliage sort of comes from a central location at the crown of that plant. You can see the foliage is heavily dissected um, adding a really nice texture into the garden. It only gets to be about a foot tall um, and so it's just pretty low maintenance. There are no pest problems really with this plant or disease problems either. And in fact, you won't even have a problem with the deer liking this plant because the foliage is toxic. Now, if you wanted to um, save the seeds on this plant, what you might wanna do is cold stratify it. So either plant those seeds later in the fall as you go into that cold, moist season, or you can take some of those seeds and put them in a um, container with some potting soil and then put them in the refrigerator for a few weeks, uh, several weeks, um, a period of time to in fact induce that germination on these plants. 
It is uh, native, like I said, mainly to eastern United States because it likes that shade condition. Um, you can see here, what's nice though is we are under a deciduous shade, meaning it gets more exposure when it's kind of taking center stage, but later on it's going to get a little bit more shade. Because it does need some moist conditions, however, it will tolerate dry conditions. You just might find that it actually goes dormant, um, but really later on in the season, it's going to get covered over with other perennials as well. So nothing to be too concerned about, pretty low maintenance. A nice addition to your shade garden here in Oklahoma, especially eastern Oklahoma. kitchen today because I want to introduce you to a new person that you're going to be seeing right here on Oklahoma Gardening. This is Christy Evans who is an extension specialist um, and you are a registered dietitian, correct? Yeah, yes, I'm a registered dietitian. So we have convinced her to start doing our cooking segments for us here on Oklahoma Gardening and we're so excited to have you. So thank you so much. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background with extension and also, you know, your field of uh, expertise? Yeah, so I originally started with OSU Extension back in 2007, um, and then I left after about three to four years and went and did some other things as a registered dietitian. Um, I worked as um, consulting for a while and worked with, for the WIC program, um, but then I came back, and um, I originally was when I came back with the Community Nutrition Education Program mm -hmm. in Oklahoma County. And we actually knew each other back in the yeah. day when I was in Canadian County. Yeah, yeah. yeah we worked <laughs> Yeah, together then. Um, but then I uh, went to work as um, in Cleveland County after that as an FCS educator. Okay, and now you're up here on Stillwater campus. So glad to have you up here. And it looks like you're ready to start cooking already. So what do we have here? <laughs> well, um, I, I have, have some vegetable scraps. Um, usually when people make um, a vegetable broth, they will have about you know eight cups of vegetables that they plan to make a broth with. Um, but you don't have to, you know, cut up a whole piece of vegetable in order to make broth. You know, okay. you can make it with scraps um, instead of just throwing them away or... Um, this would go to my compost pile, honestly. <laughs> That's what it looks like it's for, but... Well, yeah, and I mean, it, putting it in a compost pile, at least, you know, you'd be putting it to use right. so besides, you know, putting it in the trash can. Um, but, you know, you can keep that and make your broth. It'll save you, um, you know, save you a little bit of money. Absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, so is there a recipe to making a vegetable broth or...? You can find a recipe, um, but it's really not complicated at all. Okay. Um, you just, you know, start with what vegetables you've got, pretty much. I mean, there's some vegetables, you know, that you might want to stay away from, but um, you, you just uh, want to probably do about equal parts of right. water to your vegetables. Let's go ahead and go through this process then. Okay, yeah, so um, one other thing that, to mention is um, if you don't want to make a broth right away, like, mm -hmm. like we're, we're going to do today, you could um, take your vegetable scraps and put them in um, a bag, you okay. know, labeled, um, and put it in the freezer until you have the amount that you want to make, um, oh, okay. a, if you want to make a large amount of broth or you know or a freezer safe container like that with a lid okay um, but we're just gonna make a smaller amount and just make our broth okay excellent so um so what we've got is some onion skins um i'm gonna go ahead and so the these. actual skins that you wouldn't be utilizing otherwise or right yeah. yeah yeah and then we've got some ends of some bell peppers mm -hmm. um and then we've got uh some celery tops and ends and um you know, all of these vegetables are perfectly fine. They're right. just, yeah. So they're going to add basically the flavoring to the water that we put in them. Right. Later on. Uh -huh. So. Yep. And then we've got peels from carrots. Okay. Um, but there is one thing, you know, that when you plan to use 
your carrot peels and the ends and all that, you really need to make sure that you do wash the vegetables okay. and scrub them. So, um, because you know, if you're putting peels in there, you don't want that dirt. Or you don't want any extra broth. minerals in there, right? Right. <laughs> okay. right. And then, um, then herbs, we've got some stems from, um, some herbs. So, you know, typically people just, you know, take the leaves right. off or, you know, throw the the rest away, but those are great in broth too. It gives, gives it a nice uh, flavor. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So really any herbs will work on that too, right? You don't, right, okay. yeah, yeah. Whatever herbs, you know, that you have, or if you have certain, you know, ones that you like to season your okay. broth with, they'd be great. Um, also by using herbs, then you're gonna be less likely to wanna add salt. So, <laughs> gotcha. you know, that's a good okay. thing. Um, but yeah, so once that's added in the pot, then we'll just pour in our water. And again, you know, you wanted to have it um, pretty, you know, like equal parts, but um, a good idea is so that you want the vegetables to be covered okay. in water. Okay. Yeah. If you use a little bit less water, it's just going to make it a little bit more concentrated. Or if you add more, then, you know, it's going to um, not be as flavorful. So kind of, you know, is it again, another personal preference on okay. how you... So could you err on the side of it being more concentrated? And then in the dish, obviously, you could probably always add more water to it later. You could, but you really have to keep an eye on it then okay. to make sure, you know, as it boils. Oh, then, it, yeah. when you're making it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So now this is a broth, correct? Right. So yeah. what is the difference? Like I hear, you know, vegetable broth and vegetable stock or chicken stock. What is the difference between those things? Okay. So now when we're talking vegetables, there really is no difference between okay. a stock and a broth. Okay. Um, but with meat and poultry, a stock is made from the bones. So, you know, you boil the bones and um, that's a stock. Okay. And a broth is made by the meat. So oh, if you okay. have the meat and, um, but sometimes people will talk about, you know, vegetable broth or vegetable stock. It's basically. Because the they also say bone broth, broth, right? Don't right. they? So bone, that would technically be a stock though? Right. Okay. Yeah. Bone broth is, is just stock <laughs> with, with a uh, fancier name, I guess. Okay. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, you just once you get all of the vegetables and the water in your pot, then you'll just turn it to medium high heat until it boils. Um, then we'll just put the lid on it and uh, let it simmer for about 45 minutes to an hour. Okay, so it needs to really kind of get those flavors out of those vegetables for a bit. Yeah, yeah, okay. give it time to... Yeah. So is, you mentioned there are some maybe vegetables that we shouldn't be using. What are some things that we should not add to our not vegetable use. stock? Um, something like cauliflower or broccoli, you okay. really wouldn't want to add, um, or Brussels sprouts. Okay. Brussels sprouts especially would give it a really bitter, you know, oh, okay. a bitter flavor to it. Okay. Um, so those would be ones to stay away from. And of course, you know, like like lettuce, you know, anything with leaves um, that you, you really, it's going to cook down and be, you know. Okay not really hold the shape or hold any, so. Right, right, yeah. okay. Okay, so now that our broth has been boiling for um, it's been almost an hour, um, we'll go ahead and turn it off. Okay. And. Um, I love the color that it's taken on now. It is, it's gotten really pretty, a pretty color. Okay, we'll just set the lid to the side. Okay. Um, and at this point, you've got options. You can um, take the pot, put a strainer over a bowl, and then just dump the contents of the pot into that strainer. Okay. So that way you're straining off the liquid. Um, but what I like to do is use a skimmer. Okay. Um, I think this part, this way it's a little bit easier, but we can just take this and um, we'll just scoop out our vegetables. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll just scoop out our vegetables and put these into the bowl. Okay. And then I have a question for you, Casey. Oh, okay. You, <laughs> you mentioned um, using your scraps as a compost. Right, right, for compost. right. Yeah. Well, um, could you still use them as a compost? Yes, absolutely, of course. So you might want to wait till it cools off just a little bit. It's not boiling anymore. But otherwise, yeah, by the time you get that out to the garden, it's still good organic matter that's going to continue to break down and feed the soil for the garden. So absolutely. Good. So, so really, you've got three purposes out yeah, of it, right? These, <laughs> well, that's what I was thinking too. These vegetables like have really served their purpose absolutely. at that point. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So once you get all of your vegetables out of your broth, um, then you can store it. If you're going to use it within three to four days, you could go ahead and put it in the refrigerator. Um, I, you know, like these types of bowls. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of bowl, actually, it would work in the refrigerator or the freezer. Okay. So um, three to four days in the refrigerator, or if you're not going to use it within that amount of time, 
then put it in the freezer, um, and it can store in the freezer for three to four months. Okay. We just want to make um, sure it's labeled, right? Just mm -hmm. make sure it's labeled. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't, you know, you want to make sure that you know what you've got in right. there. Um, also, it needs to be a freezer safe container if it's going in the freezer. Or you could store it in a mason jar. Um, a wide mouth mason jar would work great um, to put it in the refrigerator or the freezer. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Christy, for this recipe, and we look forward to many more this season. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks. For this recipe and more like it, scan this QR code. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. It's time to start planting. Join us next week as we celebrate the season right here on Oklahoma Gardening. In fact, it's called um, uh, self, what is it called? Shoot. <laughs> dry, or excuse me, not moist dry soil. That doesn't make sense. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriters the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, and Shape Your Future, a program of the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust. Additional support is also provided by Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticulture Society, the Tulsa Garden Club, and the Tulsa Garden Center.